Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. I'm Paul Asadorian. I am joined by no stranger to the show, Farah Mavatuna, the CEO of NetSparker. Farah, welcome. Hey, Paul. Nice to be here again. Yes, nice to have you. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I wear lots of hats, right? Sometimes it's hacking and exploiting things. Sometimes it's building software. Sometimes it's scanning things, right? And I haven't, like, made the full circle back around to go... What are all of those subtle differences between the DASTs today? Because a lot of things have changed since I've done an in-depth study. Things in web applications and browsers change all the time, and no one person could keep up without the help of tooling, right? So, Farah, I want to hear from you. Some of the, like, if people are out there shopping in the virtual, uh, you know, Black Hat Expo, what are some of the major differences and considerations when you're looking for a DAST solution? Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the big deals is with the DAST. And, you know, I remember when we first started doing NetSparker 10 years ago, when we take it to the market, there were like some shortcomings, right? We would have missed some vulnerabilities because mm -hmm. we never getting around to add them and all that. And I remember having this challenge like, hey, look, our challenge is we go to a customer and it's almost like we are selling them antivirus, but we tell them, hey, we missed 40% of the viruses. Right. Like, why would they even buy it, right? Like, they will just pick something that picks up 99%. So while that's a simplification of the situation, I think that's the core challenge with Dust. Um, so from a buyer point of view and from a user point of view, you want to buy something that doesn't miss vulnerabilities, meaning high coverage. And when I say coverage, coverage like two things in, in Dust, dynamic scanning. Mm -hmm. So one is, can you even find the link? Can you even find the endpoint to attack? And the other one, if you have the endpoint almost you know, delivered to you, can you find the vulnerability? So like mm -hmm. that's all of parts of the coverage, right? If you cannot find the link uh, or the endpoint, well, you're not gonna be able to find the vulnerability, but even if you have that point, will you even find the vulnerability? It's the same thing with a testing process of any kind for any software, right? Is you have to find all of the entry points, basically, in any... I mean, this goes back to QA 20 years ago when we were testing static applications on the desktop, right? We had to physically make a plan to make sure we could find all the functionality. Then we had to make sure we tested all that functionality and didn't miss anything. Like, that basic software principles hasn't changed in, you know, 60 years, right? Absolutely. I mean, to be honest, if we, if we were to simplify a lot of things, you would put security on the QA somewhere, but like, yeah, you know, agreed. <laughs> I, I agree. But, yeah. but you're right. You're absolutely right. And like, if you think about unit testing, it's, it's a very same concept, right? Mm -hmm. You always got like, hey, what is your unit testing coverage? So meaning how much of your code is actually being tested and security right. got the exact same challenge. So which brings us to like hold this dust challenge where, okay, so if you want a DAS to be I would say like acceptable level, mm -hmm. your baseline is so high, it's unbelievable. Like, you know, again, like historically, I remember talking with developers and trying to explain them what a verification security scanner is. Mm -hmm. And they would immediately assume, oh, okay, but like it wouldn't work for my application because, you know, it's all JavaScript. So like yep. they wouldn't even guess that there's a possibility that it might support JavaScript because it seems so far-fetched to them. Uh, which I thought was quite funny. Well, and that's the legacy, Farah, that we're, we have to deal with with DAST, right? And, and things we try and highlight on the show. Like, we're very well aware that a lot of app, most application, modern applications today have some JavaScript in them somewhere, right? Regardless of what, like, like we write an application in Python, but we have JavaScript, you know, as well. Most applic web applications do. And I think it really, it, part of the DAST kind of uh, criteria is how well you can implement a full browser as part of your test, which before that may have never been the case. And that's the perception people are running under is, oh, it's just an external scanner. Whereas today, many modern DAS, NetSparker included, right, have a full full browser, right? You guys use Chromium right un under the hood. So it's a full browser, right? You need that. Absolutely. I mean, to, to be honest, even back in the day, like we started with Internet Explorer, which mm -hmm. was like kind of the de facto at the time for the yeah. web applications. But like you have to do it, like even from the first day we had it, because otherwise, you know, it's not even worth doing it because like, hey, if you if you cannot crawl 60 percent of random applications, yeah. then like what are we even doing? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the web <laughs> applications change to require the, the browser to be able to interpret them and, and get the, you know, access all of the functionality in the applications, basically what it comes down to. 
Absolutely. So, like, the, the, the thing is, is with that, so you gotta, like, that very high bar said, so you gotta support JavaScript, you gotta support all this crazy framework, mm. single page applications, like jQuery kind of very standard components, like everything needs to, you know, work. And then <clears throat> once that's there, then your coverage needs to be there in terms of finding vulnerabilities. And if you think about coverage, there are like two key components, which is like a very old school CGI scanning. Yep. You know, I think that, that's a way to put it. Like, hey, there's a known vulnerability and you need to check something whether it exists or not, which is important, mm. but not necessarily challenging or very hard to do. Right. And still present in applications today, I've noticed there are still request arguments being passed through the application. And even single page applications all have some functionality where they're passing a request argument, right? It, it just happens. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, like, I think, you know, looking at Dust, um, uh, the way I position Dust, like, you know, putting a couple of, let's say, cut, you know, very generalization and, and the categories, right? So you have Dust, like, you know, NetSpark, where uh, the technology has been improved, like, over many, many years. Mm. And it's been used and adopted by, like, large uh, user base. And... R&D focused on actually solving this very problem of dynamic application secret scanning. And, and then you got other kind of DAS, which is like, hey, guys, we do something else, but I think we can sell our customers dust as well, so let's just sell, some, sell them something. Right, you know? right, right. Uh, which generally boils down to the fact, uh, okay, look, we don't need to find everything. Let's find the most obvious things in the most obvious places, like cross-site scripting and yeah. SQL injection or something like that. And we don't need to support JavaScript or not that well. We don't need to support complex authentications. So it's kind of like a light dust that mm. like we call it internally, actually. Mm -hmm. So, hey, it's a dust, it's a dust. Is it really a dust? No, not really. It's a, like a very light version of what you would expect from a, a complete dust. If yeah, exactly. no, I, I completely agree. And there are those technologies on the market. And I mean, sometimes they do have their place, but you have to realize the limitations, right? How much of the scope of the application you're going to miss and entire classes of vulnerabilities that you're going to miss, right, as well. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. I think this is where it gets to the, you know, the part of, like, budget investment kind of concerns. Okay, like, what do we need? How much we need it? Mm -hmm. And we have customers, for example, they onboard everything on the mission critical on our site, but they're a bit reluctant to onboard everything else, and they keep like a, these really simple solutions and all of that. And they slowly move as as they feel like, oh, what else needs to also be secure? Right, you know, right. Look at. But I think the, the the real challenge here, and this is my you know this is just my view to be honest. Um, I think they just laser focus on solving one problem versus giving a service or doing something else as your core, core business, it just changes the company and, and, and the DNA. Mm. So today, we have a company of like over 220 people with mm. a massive R&D team, right? So just focusing on like 95% of that team is purely focused on dust in, right. in many levels, right. either development, research, and that bunch of stuff around it. So you do this for decades and more than a decade, and that's now your DNA. Now everyone in the company knows what, what we are doing, how we are doing, what our approach. Like, you know, there are, let, let me give you an example how this how this affects in, in real world. So when customer comes back to us and say, hey, I'm scanning this very, very, very complex website and it takes like 30 hours, right? Or it doesn't finish the scan. We never ever say, oh, like, okay, too bad for you. It's a big website, so it's not possible. No, we don't, we don't do that. So mm -hmm. we are like, okay, that's a bug. There is no website in the world that should take more than 48 hours because there is no website right. in the world that has, se let's say, 7,000 truly unique different code, you know, uh, backed pages. So if a scan takes that long, it must be a problem about our scanner or how it's been configured. And even if it's a configuration, then we think about it and say, okay, okay, we can manually configure this, but why didn't we do that configuration automatically? Yeah, that's awesome. Are there any limitation around it? And, and, and now the kind of feature is here, okay, can we do that in machine learning? Like, okay, whatever like, right. possibilities here, because we don't dismiss it as like, oh, it's a problem, we don't care and learn to live with it. We are like, hey, this is literally what we do as a company. 
re-innovating DAS, we sold this DAS, and this needs to be sold because when my customer has 5,000 websites, and they do, and they do have more websites, certain customers, I cannot go back to and tell them, configure your 5,000 website correctly because, well, that's not a possible task. So right. what is the realistic approach here? How can I detect 95% of the configuration right just automatically? Yeah, I, I think of it, you know, having worked for a vulnerability scanning company, we had these, you know, a lot of these discussions around this topic. And I think what it comes down to is like the three legs of a stool, right? Because you have to have the best performance possible. You have to minimize false positives and false negatives and balance those balancing those three things together, especially in a web application is super, super hard. And like you're saying, Farah, if you don't have the dedication to that and the R and D, you, you're not going to have those conversations all the time. I'm sure it's a daily conversation for you that basically boils down to like, how do we balance all three of these things for all these vulnerabilities and web applications out there, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and th that's really it, you know. Like, this is what you sleep. Like, this is what you think. Mm. This is what you do. And I think, to be honest, we got another advantage and not many companies do have. Um, so I am the original founder. I originally written the code in, you know, uh, started in 2006. So started right next mm -hmm. market. So now being the CEO of the company, now the whole company culture is around, hey, we got to do the best product. Mm -hmm. It has to be the best. It has to have the best coverage, uh, best performance. And if my team come back to me and this happens, uh, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah this, there's no way this website can be scanned for than 30 hours. I'm like, bring it to me. Let's go. Yeah, let's Here's go. what you do. Here's what you do. Here's right. what you see. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's like, you know, that's an example of, hey, I don't take no for an answer for that because I know for a fact that's doable. Like right. you have to prove me why it's not doable. I don't have to prove you because I already told you how it's, you know, how it's doable. Right. Because so as I soon think as... That, again, yeah, changes all how, how a company approaches to their tasks. Yeah, because as soon as you think it is a one-off, I mean, it's probably not. With the number of web applications we have today, if one customer comes to you with that, you know, that issue in, that you found and or, or didn't find, right, because you want to improve the product, there's got to be other web applications that are doing something similar, right? Like, no one has the unique unicorn of web applications. I mean, maybe there's a couple, but most of the time when you're addressing that issue, right, it's because there's more stuff out there like that. Oh, yeah, Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, one of the rules that we set up really early, like how we approach the regression testing, right? You know, you, you talked about it. Mm. Because the biggest challenge here today is the balancing act. So while you are doing improvements, you can quickly be burned by actually start breaking the old stuff that you used to identify, yep. you used to very successfully handle, oh, or not I, slow and you need to optimize it. I do that so, all the time in my code. I break stuff all, I'm like, ah, oh, great new feature. I'm like, ah, oh, I broke something else, right? And so I can imagine the regression testing that NetSparker has to go through with, with the complexity of being able to scan all these web applications. Oh yeah, like I mean, I'm gonna ignore all the like the whole the tray process and all that. But if I focus just one piece of the regression testing, kind of like pretty much unique to how our product and you know, so something we built internally, uh, we put vulnerable applications mm -hmm. and vulnerable particular test cases, and also we put false positives, you know, true positives, and, and we do so like both false positive testing and also like kind of all. You know, do we find the vulnerability that we should be finding, but also do we find false positives, right? Mm -hmm. Like so all that makes, you know, all the possibilities. And I think today I might be wrong on the numbers, but it should be like 4,500 test cases here deployed, like all these unique cases. Imagine a cross-site scripting, but we got like 740 variations of it. Right, right. Uh, and with like all these different setups. And we even got like more, uh, what's the word, like... Um, generator testing, imagine a cross-site scripting, but hey, do we find it when it's in 404? Do we find it when it's 500? Do we find yeah. it uh, if there's a this beginning, if there's this ending? So like all these complex cases, and we actually got a system to automatically generate those test cases and just like every single build or like, you know, sometimes you run it on schedule base because it's just too heavy at a certain point, yep. um, run on that automation. And whenever something is wrong, it like, raises a ticket immediately. So kind of like a, think about secure SDLC, how you want to hear your bugs, so it's like a very good trade process on that. Mm -hmm. But just to focusing on our domain and how we solve this. So once a customer says, I missed this, you missed this vulnerability, we fix it and we fix it for good because now it's on a test automation. Mm -hmm. So it should never ever uh, be broken again. Right, right. And that's important. Uh, you know, and oftentimes 
folks don't talk about their own internal process as you've described. And the process you've described is one I'm striving for in our own internal software, right? Because that's the place you have to be. You have to be able to very quickly and easily regression test, test for security on just an automated basis so that developers can focus on implementing new features and know if they, that works or not and or if they broke something else in the process, right? Definitely. And that's like, you know, when we talk about secure CLC, that's exactly the same philosophy, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, to be honest, a lot of things security is doing is just trying to replicate what is already defined and well executed in software development field. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, so, true. hey, look, yeah, like agile is very well defined and the QA within agile is very well defined and the best practices more or less are the same. And now we are just trying to catch up on security to that. So it's not mm. like, that's complicated. The path is there. But the fact that there's massive complication technically to get there, yes. which is where I think why I personally believe innovation and technological advancement within the security product is key to the success. And the mm -hmm. vision of it is while important, not necessarily requires, takes a genius. Like almost anyone can see it who is, who is doing this, but like only a few can execute it to that level. And if someone don't see it, it's mostly like when, when we talk to the customers, it's quite often um, you explain them the situation and they're at a point like, OK, look, I, I didn't know any product was even doing this. So I wasn't right. asking for it. So I'm like not really intrig intrigued that you're explaining this concept because it makes a lot of sense. But like I wouldn't have expect any product to be doing it because their you know, expectations of adjust is so low. Yeah, uh, it's kind yeah. of like you know, kind of changing their mind immediately when we talk about like all the stuff that we can do. Well, and it's a great point, for You know, if you've got these, can you know, perceptions about a DAST, um, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, and there's any hesitation, I encourage people to go to securityweekly.com forward slash netsparker, go get the trial and try it out for yourself. Um, and I mean, we use it here internally, we've been using it for actually for, for some time. Uh, and it's just, it's, you know, fantastic, uh, balance, you know, it comes back to that balance of performance and reduction of false positive and false negatives. And, and you guys have a great, uh, product and balancing all those three things. Uh, so go try it out. Farah, thank you so much for appearing on security weekly. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with guess what more interviews. Stay tuned.